very warm welcome to the third and the last episode of Beyond Mobility. Today we try and understand successful entrepreneurship coupled with visionary engineering that go much beyond just mere market appeal but also focus on environment conservation. These green initiatives are not just an inspiration but also act as a means of livelihood for many. So what are we waiting for? Let's go. becoming difficult to strike a balance between progress and conservation. In fact, the focus is so much on urbanization we, that we're not giving any thought about sustainable living. In times like this, one individual is teaching people to live in an eco-friendly and healthy manner. In fact, her initiative has not only given urban perspectives, but also provided livelihood to thousands of people in the region of Nanital. Well, I'm to going to be talking to none other than the founder of Geely Mitti. She's Shagun Singh and she's joining me right now on this very special show. Welcome to this special show called Beyond Mobility Shagun. Truly a pleasure speaking with you. Thank, Thank you for having me over. Well, before I get into Geely Mitti and, and your wonderful initiative, tell me a little bit about yourself, Shagun. I believe you are like one of us, you know, in the corporate world and you've given it all up and come and living in beautiful Nanital. Um, yes, so same old story as uh, most of us, worked in the corporate sector for over 10 years, before that had done my MBA in finance and marketing, uh, was leading that same old life and ultimately when things seemed too amiss, then I decided to make a change and that's where Gili Mitti started. Sure, so you know, tell us a little bit about Gili Mitti, like I know the basics, it's a mud house, it's eco-friendly. And I believe that, you know, even in the cold, like we are here today, it keeps warm. And when it's warm, it, it maintains to cool itself. So tell me about, a little bit about the technology and how this thought sure. was triggered, you know, and, mm. and how you actually main, uh, got into this entire, uh, you know, uh, NGO called Gili Mitti. Let me first talk about what you just started off with in terms of the advantages of living in a mud home or even building with one. Sure. And when we say mud, I'm going to include all other natural materials. So whether that's stone or that's lime or that's straw, all of it. Using different technologies, um, earth bag, cob, rammed earth, adobe, wattle and daub. The technique names are different, but the materials being used are the same. Okay. Now these materials have something called thermal mass and the other materials which have insulation. Okay. What that does is that when it is very cold outside, it maintains your indoor temperature as very warm. And when it's really hot outside, even in desert climate, it automatically regulates the temperature for it to be cool inside. Okay. Now that means you don't need these energy guzzling air conditioners or heaters all the time. Additionally, what most people don't know is its property to control humidity. So again, dehumidifiers, humidifiers, you don't need any of that. So Shagun, how is this project of yours uh, fared in terms of the eco sector and what is what is your vision for Geely Mitti? Uh, before even talking about Geely Mitti, I was talking about it a little earlier with the team as well, is you know our focus as a society is so much on environment today, at least for talking, whether we do something about Food it or not, yeah. Yeah, yeah, at least for drawing room discussions. So everybody's talking about agriculture, organic farming, water conservation, water harvesting, building soil in different scales and levels, waste management, sewage treatment systems. You know, people are talking about these and there's so many organizations that are focusing on it as well. But what I realized was that one of the biggest contributors to your pollution and to all your issues and carbon emissions is the construction industry. I'll share a few very critical figures. 23% of air pollution is caused by the construction industry alone. 40% of your entire freshwater resources is used up by the construction industry. 50% of your landfill waste are contributed to by the construction industry. So it seems to me pretty commonsensical if you think about it, that if we just took care and focus on this construction industry alone, mm. imagine the difference that we can make. 
Tell me something, and this is an amateurish doubt because I'm not as educated about, like you in this particular area. Uh, so if I look at your houses that you've made, these beautiful homes, uh, which are so eco-friendly, tell me to make this transition to cities like Bombay, Delhi. Uh, we all live in tall mm -hmm. skyscraper buildings just because of the population that this, these cities have. How do we have space to live in such beautiful eco-friendly homes like this? Let me answer both. Yeah. Okay. First, we don't really have such a big space crunch. And sustainability is all about decentralization. Our problem in planning itself today is that we are trying to centralize systems, whether that's production, whether that's how humans live, everything is being centralized. Second, you can build multi-storied apartments with eco bricks, mud bricks, adobe. The entire city of Yemen, if you look it up and so many others, there are 10 floored apartments since over 500 years, still inhabited. The whole city is built of skyscrapers by mud. So it is totally, I mean, it's, I won't even say it's doable because it's always been done. Even if you look at any of our forts, all of our forts, how high are they? And they're all built out of natural materials without needing concrete for that matter. So that's not an issue. Okay. Also, in your cities, it's not like you need to demolish everything and build NU. There's something called retrofitting. So within our existing buildings, we teach that also as a part of our courses. We teach you how to retrofit existing buildings so that the benefits that we get from mud buildings, you are able to get over there by just changing your paint, oh. by just changing your plaster, by just changing your cleaning product, by just making your windows and doors more energy efficient, by just changing the solar passive design principles in your home. Just by doing this much itself, 25% of energy savings and carbon emissions can be reduced immediately. Wow. Nothing needs to change. So the solutions are really simple. Okay, so now let's move on to Gili Mithi. What is your attempt here with this initiative? Mm -hmm. And uh, what is your vision in terms of taking Gili Mithi to larger cities? You know, Gili Mithi is involved in a lot of different aspects, but we'll particularly focus on the regenerative living environment. Okay. Now for a human being to live in, it's not just shelter. You know, we say you need food, you need water and you need shelter. Now food and water, as I said, too many people are focusing on and that's still the contribution is fairly low compared to your living environment. From a shelter perspective, it includes not just your house, but also all the systems and technologies associated with it. Okay. So whether that's your water harvesting or it's your water recycling, then it's your water management into grey water systems and black water systems, separating the two and dealing with it separately. It's waste management, it's sewage treatment, it's energy systems and it's food production. So when we talk about natural buildings, we talk about all of these put together. And at Gili Mitti, we wanted to create a space where any of us, you know, you, me, your friends, wherever all of us want to do good, all of us want to live in a regenerative way. So if you want to do that in your house, whether, as you said, you're living in an apartment or you're living in a rented apartment, or you have your own house, or you even have a farmhouse, it doesn't matter. You can come to this one place to figure out what systems would be right for your particular situation in life without changing your lifestyle. Ah. All of those systems you will get trained on over here. You will see them live over here. You will get the contacts of the vendors to be able to install it at your place. So this is a one-stop solution that gets provided. Well, on that note, thank you so much, Agun. This has been a fascinating, a very, very enlightening uh, conversation for me. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's amazing to witness uh, uh, a project that is not just greener and healthier, but 100% eco-friendly. So kudos to you for throwing away your comfortable urban life and coming and starting this initiative. And lots of luck for you in 2022. Hopefully, a lot of us are much more educated and aware about how to live responsibly. Lovely meeting with you. Same here. Thank you so much for having me over. Amidst the pristine Himalayas, one initiative is bringing change in the fashion industry through an eco-friendly manufacturing approach. An effort by Zoya and Nitich is slowly paving the way for a sustainable existence leading to empowered communities. The current pandemic situation didn't allow a face-to-face -face conversation but we were able to catch Zoya online. Welcome to the special episode of Beyond Mobility, Zoya. Truly a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much, Sonali. It's so great to be here. So first up, uh, you know, Zoya, uh, 
tell me a little bit about Asli in terms of how it was conceptualized and how it materialized into being what it is today. So Sonali, that's a slightly longer story because it took us a bit to get here. Uh, there's two of us who co-founded Asli, Nitij and I, and we both don't come from the fabric apparel fashion industry at all. Um, but we've generally been climate action enthusiasts. We've been focused on sustainable development for a while. And uh, the idea was born a while back when my partner Nitij was living and working in Nepal and I was about to visit him uh, and the Nepal earthquake happened and it was really bad. There was a lot of death, destruction, loss of property, livelihood. And uh, the idea sort of was born out of what can we do to provide aid? Like that was the inception of it. And then we realized that, you know, aid is never a solution. It's, it's a band-aid. Uh, solution is actually sustainable development in terms of employment and continuous growth and, uh, you know, fixed sort of income repeating itself within adding to the economy. That's how Asli was born because we chanced upon these communities that needed help, uh, these groups of weavers. And initially the thought was, you know, we'll buy stuff from them and that will help. But then how do we make it a running chain? That, that was the inception of when it all started. Um, there was a crowdfunding campaign that we did. We got a bunch of people interested. We realized that there's a huge market for what we've sort of chanced upon. And this is a massive opportunity to invest in the community that could really do with more exposure. Okay. So moving on to, you know, what's really the essence of Asli and how, you know, Asli is innovating with sustainable fabrics. Uh, take me through that process because I'm a layman and so are my viewers. So the essence of Asli is a little bit tricky to define because, I mean, for us, it's a living, breathing organism. It's evolving every day. But what we know that we want to do is, and in whatever space it is in, because we also work with homeware, accessories, apparel, there's a couple of new lines that we're exploring. The idea is to do more good than harm. Uh, because fashion, uh, more I mean, now it's being viewed as a harmful industry, although it has been that way for a while because of essentially overconsumption. So our essence is to focus on the good, to do more good. And it's not just purely in terms of what we're selling, but also the communities that we're working with, the kind of materials that we're working with, the awareness that we're driving around it. So uh, largely that is the essence of Asli. We work with hemp, we work with bamboo, we work with something very interesting called Himalayan nettle, which uh, is a fiber found locally in the Himalayan communities in India and Nepal, but a lot of people don't know about it. We work with something called bimal. So, uh, we, we spend a lot of time educating ourselves on what is available locally, what communities are developing it, and how do you take it further to the world. But tell me, uh, on the basis of your experience after starting Asli, uh, do you honestly think there is a shift towards sustainable fashion in India? Are you seeing that shift? And are Indians really aware and conscious about, you know, being eco-friendly and, and, and being responsible about fashion? Most definitely. Um, it's it's a bit of a mix. While sustainability as a whole is very largely present in our overall culture, right? Because we've grown up as a society of hand-me-downs. We've used, like, it doesn't matter if your brother's wearing something, you will inherit that even if you're the sister. So we, we as a culture, we've invested a lot in khadi and cotton and, like, um, mothers have passed down saris for generations. So sustainability exists in our culture whether we adapt it in this new format or not, um, it's still something that's growing. Uh, fast fashion in our sort of circles is like, is a problem, definitely. But people are a lot more open to being educated about why sustainable is better. So a large part of our effort and a large part of our sort of work is also educating people on um, what is the alternative to synthetics? What is the alternative to say a polyester, you know? And why is the alternative preferable um, not just in terms of how it's produced, but also if you just look at our climate. We are a very natural fabric friendly climate. Uh, so education is very important. That's what we focus on, on a lot. But yeah, people are more than happy to sort of at least find out what, what it is that is going on and how they can be better in their everyday choice. A last question, uh, Zoya, if I let you go. Uh, take me through what Asli has done in terms of you know, sustainable community building, climate change mitigation, and really empowering uh, the uh, indigenous Himalayan communities. So we started very small. We started working with uh, local weaving clusters. Uh, that's how we sort of started the process of sustainable development, because for us being a sustainable brand isn't just about what we're selling. It's also very strongly about what we're sourcing. 
Uh, one of the things that we've done is we've worked with the mountain communities in Uttarakhand, so Almora, Rishikesh, we've worked with the weaving clusters that largely employ women and through COVID they've been able to continue the work from their homes, if not the factories. Um, so that's a community that we're very strongly invested in. Uh, nettle is something that we're very passionate about because it's available locally, people don't know about it and it's something that hasn't yet been adapted to power loom, so mm. it's all hand done but it has great potential. It's one of the strongest fibers in the world. So, you know, whether you're making homeware or bags or shoes or clothes, that fabric can be used for anything as long as it can be processed better, easier, and it provides for great economic opportunity. So those are the sorts of things we're focused on and we're building on. Well, I must say, Zoya, this has truly been uh, fascinating and more importantly, uh, uh, a learning uh, conversation for me. Uh, I definitely, for my, on my part, will try and be more conscious in terms of clothing, uh, to, you know, whether I go shopping, what I buy or or how I use my clothing. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, hopefully, uh, Asli and many such ventures such as yours will educate, uh, you know, the Indian masses to be more responsible and more ethical in their consumption. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Sonali. This was great. Wasn't that an absolutely fascinating and interesting conversation? What gives me hope is innovators like Zoya and Nitish who are committed in their efforts towards creating a sustainable practice that, that benefits not just community but also our environment. Well, it's time for a short breather, but on the other side is an interesting conversation on the sustainability practices adopted by Hyundai Motor in India. have with us Mr. Punnaivanam S, who is the Vice President and National Service Head at Hyundai Motor India Limited. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for joining us into this conversation. And I would like to start by asking you that what role does Hyundai aim to play in society's transition towards the usage of clean energy while ensuring effective and efficient utilization of resources that we find around us? Thank you, Anuya, for the question. As a socially responsible brand, at Hyundai Motor India, sustainability forms the core of all our functions. Our plant at Chennai is a great example of green manufacturing practices, such as 89% renewable energy usage for the factory operations, rainwater harvesting for self-sustenance, 100% LED lighting system across the facility, state-of-the-art regenerative thermal oxidizer in both the plants, over 33% green belt area with almost 21,000 trees. In addition to the above, we have recently announced the expansion of our range to six battery EVs by 2028 to offer sustainable mobility solution to our new age customers. So you've just spoken about the Chennai manufacturing unit and how the green ways that it has adopted actually in the car manufacturing practices what change did Hyundai's rainwater harvesting actually bring in this regard? As I mentioned, we practice sustainability in all our functions and rainwater harvesting is one of the most important methods we have implemented at our manufacturing facility. With six ponds providing a total water storage capacity of 3.35 lakh kiloliters, we aim at absolute self-sustenance targeting zero external water dependency by 2025. Not just at our manufacturing plant, but also across our dealership, we are following sustainable steps in day-to-day -day operations, starting from dry wash to 100% LED light implementation. We are also aiming for 360 degree digital and paperless transactions and solarization at some of our dealerships. So you've just spoken about the rainwater harvesting and apart from this, uh, how has the dry wash technique enhanced the eco-friendly practices at Hyundai? Dry wash technique is just another initiative we follow to enhance the eco-friendly practices at all our dealerships. It has reduced our dependency on water usage in car servicing. We have been able to save more than 140 million liters of water already in this calendar year through this initiative with the support of 1.2 million customers. We are promoting dry wash under the theme of Jal Bachake Chal, endorsed by our brand ambassador, 
Mr. Shahrukh Khan. Mr. Punnevanam, everybody is talking about the e-vehicle sector and what it is going to bring to the Indian automobile sector as well. I would like to understand your thoughts on the Kona Electric and how will it make it as a valuable proposition in the Indian four-wheeler electric segment? At Hyundai, we are taking experiences beyond mobility and are strongly focusing on intelligent technology, sustainability and innovation. Keeping in line with this thought, we will introduce our dedicated BEV platform that is eGMP as well as modified platforms for battery EVs in India. By driving the adoption of electric mobility, Hyundai will become the fulcrum for transformation of a brighter and better tomorrow. We launched India's first long-range SUV, Kona Electric in 2019, which gave us the confidence to bring our new range of EVs starting 2022. We are sure that Hyundai's electrification strategy will bring big change in the Indian automobile scenario. Thank you so much, sir, for giving us your time. It was a pleasure speaking to you. Have a good day. Thank you. And with that, we come to the end of the Beyond Mobility series. I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as I've enjoyed working through it. You've met Indians who've done path-breaking work across areas of technology, innovative entrepreneurship and sustainability. This is exactly what Hyundai believes in when it ventures to build a car that goes beyond mobility. Thank you so much for joining me on my exciting journey and thanks again for watching.